every aspect of, of the calculator was there was a, a challenge and and I used to say you know if you solve one problem and you didn't create two more you're making headway and you know the battery life that you know we said that, that we wanted eight hours of battery life well, yeah. eight hours of battery life with LEDs I mean that at the time no way and so we but we had LEDs within somebody said, well, if we could put little magnifiers and then we could use smaller LEDs and we could still see them. And then when we strobed the LEDs, we found that we had super linearity and that, that we got about three times more uh, light out with the same current. Yeah. So we so could reduce the let's current. Let's do that in the yes. middle. In the context. Yeah, in the context. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I'm going to make a noise so that I get my nice uh, sound set. And then we'll get going. You can see how far away we look from each other up there as yes. opposed to here. Okay, yes. so three, two, one. and welcome today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Steve Leibson, contributing editor to EDN Magazine, and today I'm interviewing Dave Cochran in honor of the 35th anniversary of the development of the HP 35 calculator, the world's first scientific pocket calculator. And Dave played a key role in the development of the HP 35 while he was working at HP. We're going to go into the history of the HP 35, and here's some fascinating anecdotes about the development of the HP 35 from someone who was there for all of it. So first of all, Dave, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, I welcome the opportunity. Always love to tell the story. Okay. Well, now your history didn't at HP didn't start with the HP 35. I know that you were a principal in development of the HP 9100, which was HP's first desktop calculator, uh, and that you were also instrumental in developing the HP 3440 digital voltmeter, which was the first commercially successful digital voltmeter, but even before that, we worked on the HP 405AR, which was an earlier digital voltmeter. So why don't you take us through your uh, beginnings with HP and go up through the development of the 9100 and stop at the 9100, and we'll get in depth on that. All right. Um, well, I uh, had started Stanford, and I'd grown up in Palo Alto, and, and I'd uh, moved away while in the service, and then I came back. and. And I'd started Stanford, and after a year or so, I ran out of money and uh, on the GI Bill. And I'd always admired uh, Hewlett Packard Company. And in fact, uh, growing up in Palo Alto, I'd even uh, driven uh, uh, Dave Packard's Woody station wagon uh, in a get out the boat campaign. So it was logical for me to uh, interview at HP for a summer job just to tide me over and make some money so that I could uh, remain at Stanford. And uh, so I started as a junior engineer and uh, then moved into the lab uh, when the school year started on a half-time basis. So I got quite a bit of experience in the lab and one of the, the first programs that I got to work on was a 405 digital voltmeter and it had a, a um, uh, a stepping, a stepping switch to do the uh, voltage selection, and it was, it was very rudimentary, but it was still uh, uh, quite successful in the marketplace. But it taught me a lot about Hewlett Packard and uh, engineering, and complemented my my Stanford education. So then, upon graduation, I was offered a full-time job at HP Labs, uh, which had just split off. Uh, it was uh, 1958, and uh, HP had just built the, uh, uh, the buildings up on the hill, we called it, uh, 1501 Page Mill Road. And so uh, the labs were, uh, there was a core lab, which was kind of the audio video that became later the, the HP corporate labs. And the other divisions split off, uh, I think there was frequency and time and, and uh, microwave and so on. So, so what uh, year was this? Uh, that was in 1958. Okay. 
And then... Uh, so the 405 came out the year later, I believe. Then, no, 405 was about that time. Okay. Uh, and then, yeah, maybe it was uh, yeah, about just about that time. And then uh, uh, the 3440 digital voltmeter was a follow-on from there. But I think I worked, and if I remember correctly, um, uh, somebody, uh, one of the, the lab directors asked me if I wanted to work on a, on a um, transistorized uh, audio oscillator. And I said, you mean work on the, the, the 200 uh, series? And he said, well, yeah, it'd be, um, see if you could take the transistor out, or take the light bulb out and substitute it with the transistor. And transistors were just becoming, uh, uh, people were starting to use them, and I'd taken a transistor uh, course at Stanford. And so I actually worked on a 204B, it was called, and um, I was rather ashamed to talk to Hewlett about it because I'd taken his famous light bulb out of his oscillator <laughs> that had actually provided the negative feedback. And I, I did it with a, a bunch of transistors and a diode. And it was actually had more distortion than its original uh, design, but it, but it was simplified, it was much lighter, and so on. Okay. So, um, the 3440 project is, I believe, where you first worked with Chuck Neer at HP. That, that's correct, yeah. And then the two of you went on and ended up on the 9100 project. Well, the, the 9100 um, was a conglomeration of, of people. There was probably uh, 30 or 40 in the lab at that time, and I think Barney Oliver uh, called ha at least half of us in to a conference. and. And he says, um, well, you all may wonder why you're here. We're going to talk about a desktop calculator. And, and everybody, nobody had worked on calculators, or uh, there had been a few of us that had taken computer courses at Stanford uh, recently. And computers were just coming of age, but nothing in the, in the calculator realm. And uh, uh, so Barney had said, OK, I'd like you guys to listen to this. this um, about a month ago, uh, we were we've been contacted by a couple of different people, and one was Tom Osborne, and he had brought a, a four-function machine that had floating-point uh, arithmetic. Uh, it worked. It was in a balsa wood uh, cabinet. Uh, that was a green machine. The green machine. It was painted green, but it was a uh, balsa wood, and uh, the uh, uh, the other machine was uh, brought by somebody from Southern California, Malcolm McMillan, and I believe he called it the Athena or something like that. And it was a, a transcendental function, but it was fixed point. And these people had contacted HP, uh, one of them had talked to Hewlett, and one of them had talked to Barney Oliver, and uh, had said, uh, you know, here, here, here's a product that we think HP might be interested in. And actually, if you just looked at each product, there was nothing that, that jumped out. But then when Barney and, and, and uh, Hewlett got together and they were saying, well, you know, if we can put the floating point uh, architecture, and we, it, it looks like a, um, a very functional type uh, machine, if we could put that and do transcendental functions over a wide range, that might have application for scientists and engineers. Remember, Hewlett Packard, was primarily instruments for scientists and engineers, and so uh, a calculating, um, you know, a calculator was certainly not in the, uh, not in the repertoire right. of, of products. So what year was this meeting in? It seems to me it was around '65. That, that had to be '64 or '65. Okay, and so it was Barney Oliver who was really driving it. Um, at that point, I think it was Barney that, because I remember. He was, he was passing out the assignments, and we had the, the lab director, Paul Stoff, and uh, there was uh, a, a number of us in there, uh, and that's when Chuck Neer was one of those, and, and so they were passing out assignments, and they, they were saying, okay, we want so-and-so to work on the, the cathode ray tube display. It, it was nothing like we have today. Uh, right. uh, there was uh, no, no discussion of of Nixie tubes, uh, which are numerical displays or, or light emitting diodes, it was it was going to be numbers written onto a cathode cathode ray tube, 
and uh, uh, a little CRT display. And um, there was a whole bunch of, of concepts that had to be worked on. The, the architecture, um, somebody talked about a ROM, and, and you know, what's a ROM? Read-only memory. I mean, we, we were at the point where these, a lot of these things hadn't been defined. I, I remember going to a Las Vegas convention uh, on calculators and computers, and um, the uh, Lou Terman, who worked at IBM, he was the son of Fred Terman, who mm -hmm. got Hewlett and Packard together, and he gave uh, a talk on read-only memories, and he defined what a read-only memory was, and IBM was just developing those. So here, uh, I think we should point out there were no semiconductor runs at this point. Oh, ab absolutely not. Um, and. Uh, Later on, uh, we did a wire rope ROM, uh, a, a little, uh, uh, a, we had a, a core ROM and, a, uh, and then a wire rope that, that actually threaded through cores to, um, to do the... Uh, that was uh, the microcode ROM. The, the microcode, the, yes, the, the deep embedded microcode. And, uh, and we had two levels of ROM in the 9100, but anyhow, during these assignments, and people were raising their hand, or Barney was saying, hey, I want you to work on this, I want you to work on that. And he got to, to algorithms, and he said, well, now who's going to work on the algorithms? And, you know, I've, I've never been very smart in this regard. I, I said, what's an algorithm? <laughs> and, uh, and Barney jumped, you know, and he was like that. Barney Oliver was like that. If you didn't know something, he was going to teach you. So he said, Dave, you're going to find out. And you've got 30 days to figure out whether or not you can put these algorithms in this in this com composite machine. So, anyhow. Well, this would be a good time to point out that the reason we're spending time on talking about the 9100 is because those algorithms directly lead to the algorithms that go in the HP 35. Absolutely. They, they gave us the, the background of knowledge of, of both the, uh, uh, the algorithms and what it took to do a a high precision, when I say high precision, it's 10 digits with less than, than uh, one count of, of round off error, and, uh, uh, and what kind of architecture was needed to do those algorithms. And so it really provided us a, uh, a floor and an understanding of, of how, to, how to do such a machine, and then it didn't matter what size it was. Well, I think this is a good time to talk about the algorithms because most people are familiar with the Cortic algorithm and they think that pretty much everything in these calculators is based on Cortic. But I think it's a lot more complicated than that. And you may want to go through and talk about the various types of algorithms that are in these calculators and why those algorithms were used. You know, the Cortic algorithm was a, um, an acronym that was used for coordinate and rotation and digital incrementing computer, I think it was, something like that. It was, and it was a, a paper that was written by Jack Boulder, I believe he put it, uh, published it in the IEEE Journal, uh, and it uh, was based on a design that uh, he had done for the B-58 Hustler program for the auto navigation. Uh, but actually, it's a... Um, um, and he actually worked with Macmillan, I believe. Uh, yeah, and, and they, and that was the, the basis for the what was brought up as the uh, Macmillan design or Athena, I think it was called. Uh, and then, doing some research, uh, we found that there was a pseudo division, pseudo multiplication, um, and and that's all that these algorithms were is a, a, a standard math, uh, mathematics uh, the multiplication and division, you um, uh, consistently add uh, one number to another so many times, and that's multiplication. But now let's say that you, that you change the, the multiplicand each time that you add it in, and uh, you, uh, or you let your multiplier change by another means, and you can get a, a different function. So there's a whole class of functions that were described uh, in 1962 by uh, an IBM uh, scholar, uh, J.M. Megan, and they were called pseudo-division, pseudo-multiplication. And later on, when um, uh, Wang actually, uh, uh, Wang Labs, had made a, um, a desktop calculator, 
about the same time that we brought out the 9100, and theirs was called the Loci 2, and they had filed a patent uh, for a patent on the, um, I think it was a square root algorithm, and came after uh, HP and sent a letter requesting royalties. Um, I did some research at that time and discovered that um, some of these uh, algorithms, as we call them, a step-by-step -step procedure for doing things, had been around for hundreds of years. And in fact, if we look back at the notes from uh, Briggs, uh, Henry Briggs did uh, common logarithms, uh, and he was a, a, a somebody like Napier. He, he was a contemporary of Napier who did the, the natural logarithms. And to generate these logarithms, it was a uh, it developed a certain constants and then added them sequentially and created all these tables. And that's all that this is that a uh, some of these algorithms, uh, particularly the ones for log and exponential and square root, is a, just a, a trivial one of that. But it's sequential, sequentially adding uh, constants or changing constants. Uh, to, a, to a number to produce uh, under control of another number. And if you do that with log constants, then you can generate the, the logs and exponentials. And so the, um, the Greeks knew these um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, the sum of consecutive odd digits, the perfect square, the number of digits you've taken. So that's 1 plus 3 is 4. 1 plus 3 plus 5 is 9. Uh, 9 is the square of 3, and so on. Now, if you do that backwards, you got square root. And, and it becomes very trivial. And, I mean, it's quite a bit of, of, of work to do it by hand, but, but a calculating engine can just follow those rules and come out with a number. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, a digit or, or 10 digits long. Okay. Uh, one of the things I think that will interest people a lot is, why RPM? Where did that come from? Because that's part of the algorithm, obviously. Um, and, and yeah, actually, it's it's the the user interface. Right, it's uh, the overarching uh, algorithm for how the overall calculation. Uh, it, exactly. It's it's how do you want to uh, interface with the calculating engine, and RPM refers to reverse Polish notation, and it was first proposed by Jan Lukasiewicz in 1951. Wrote a paper on it. But it was used for stack architecture. And when we uh, started actually thinking about uh, how we were going to, uh, how someone would use a calculator, you know, you'd enter a number and enter another number and, and so on. We, we, how do you, do you put, it, put the numbers, you enter one and then the second one and then hit multiply and, and we, uh, decided to use a, uh, a secondary key called an enter key as a delimiter. And so you, it's very similar to what you do on, on pencil and paper. Um, you don't um, uh, put, your, put your, uh, your sign down or your, your, you know, the times or the divide sign down. You put one number, then you put another number, then you put the, the okay, I'm gonna multiply that. And then you start your operation. And, uh, and we found that it was fewer keystrokes to actually do this, and particularly scientists and engineers are always working with some long equation. You've got constants, you want to figure out the strength of materials, whether a beam is strong enough to hold up a wall, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got quite an equation. And when you start trying to sort out with parentheses and so on, you get all tang tangled up, wrapped around the axle. So it's much better to just start with the, with the internal and just start at the inside of an equation and you multiply that number and you add this number and you and so on and you just then you take the square root of that and then you can exponentiate or you can do whatever and it came out so much simpler and we used to have these contests when we first were putting together prototypes of, of how to calculate it and we tried all these different uh, uh, different routines and and we could we were trying to figure out which is the fewest keystrokes, and which ones could anybody walk up and start using almost immediately? Okay, so if I might paraphrase that, 
it takes more brain power to use RPN, but fewer keystrokes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I, I don't think you get so, so bottled up in the parentheses, let's say, do I need an extra parenthesis now? Do I, you know, why didn't it give me the answer I expected? Okay. So when, when the 9100 came out, which was six, late 68, 69, what was the reaction in the market? Uh, it, well, for one thing, it, people were astounded that, that HP had, uh, uh, you know, had gone into this field, and but the the marketplace really welcomed it. And this is a we used to say at HP that uh, we talked about the next bench syndrome, that if if the fellow at the next bench likes what you were doing, and, and wanted to use the the piece of hardware you were developing, it was probably going to be very successful. And that's what we found. We found this, this everybody falling all over themselves, uh, trying to get uh, these uh, the desktop top calculators to do the mathematical problems they were faced with constantly. And they were using either um, adding machines, uh, slide rules. They were just uh, uh, oftentimes submitting things for long jobs uh, in their computer center. And I can remember doing some of the checking but I would submit, uh, I, I submitted numbers uh, and, and have it run on a B5500 uh, over at Stanford. And I get, the, I get the answer back the next day and I found I had round off error because the B5500 was all binary and it wasn't significant, it wasn't, didn't have enough binary bits. I think it was 49, something like 49 bits or something. Just and, and some of those I had to use for exponent because I had to carry it in the same word. And this, it, uh, so I ended up uh, making emulators that, that were closer to the actual design uh, that I was going to implement. Okay. So how, how soon after the 9100 came out did Bill Hewlett start pushing for a pocket version? Well, uh, there's a story that I tell that when when we did the 9100, he had seen the, the mock-up of it, and he says, you know, I, I want that to fit in, in my desk. I've got a little secretarial slot. Uh, he had a secretary's desk, and it was a, a drawer that would pull out, and it was supposed to be for a typewriter, and he says, I'd love to have that right in there, and so I could have it with me all the time at my desk. And so when we finished up uh, the, uh, the first prototype, the working prototype, we took it over to Hewlett's desk, and he wasn't in town, and uh, he asked the secretary, can we go in and try this out? Oh, sure. So we, we pulled it off, and we tried to put it in, and it just wouldn't slide in. It lacked maybe an eighth of an inch. So you know, we weren't going to redo the whole design, and we didn't want you know, fuel its wrath. So we called up the carpenter shop, and, uh, and within a few hours, it was fitting. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know, uh, supposedly he, he found out but he never said anything because he loved to, you know, that everybody thought that they pulled one on him. Um, but then, uh, so soon after, you know, I'd say within six months, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, Hewlett was really enthusiastic about about the calculators and and how they would uh, solve uh, instrumentation problems. I mean, uh, you could now do the calculations, uh, uh, you know, right there and. And you didn't have to submit them to a, a, a long run at a computer center or whatever. So he said, you know, but I would really like to be able to carry this around with me. And my desk isn't always there. Uh, you know, I want to be in the field. I want to be at home, whatever. So I'd like, uh, and he said, Dave, I want what you put in to the 9100 to fit in my pocket. Yeah. So I was thinking, oh my God, we're going to have to get hold of, of Hewlett's Taylor and try to get some, some because at the time, uh, there was uh, a, a, a bunch of, uh, of four function machines, but they, they were, none of those at that time would fit in his pocket even. And we're thinking of the architecture that needed to go into this and semiconductors were just starting out. The um, so 9100. Really weren't even battery powered at that point. Oh, right. Uh, the, uh, and the 9100 was, was all, it was either discrete logic or small scale integration. It, it, there was nothing, there was very little integration uh, about that. Uh, as far as I know, it's got a couple of analog ICs in the card reader, and that's it. Everything else is discrete transistors. Yep, yeah. yeah. 
Okay. So, uh, is that what you did immediately after the 9100 project? Well, no. to start thinking about the, well, 30, the 35? Uh, I probably, I was working on some other things. I uh, worked on a printer uh, for the 9100 and uh, that would be electrostatic. The electrostatic blaster? Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think that one would uh, have survived on an airplane because it certainly generated a lot of uh, radio RFI. But uh, so I, there was other projects I was working on, but every chance that Hewlett had, he would, he would come by and, and, Dave, how are you coming with, you know, reducing the size and, and getting that, that, you know, the desktop calculator into a pocket calculator? And in fact, he had pushed on industrial design, and industrial design had, had taken in and started working on, the, uh, on that concept. Um, and they knew Hewlett's pocket size, and they had, uh, were saying, okay, we, yeah, this is the size that it's got to be. And I kept looking at it, and God, now how am I going to fit uh, integrated circuits? Because at the time, we, you know, we kind of knew the architecture. I, uh, I figured that it had to have uh, 10 digits. It, it was probably going to be a binary coded decimal. Uh, because it, it uh, had to interact with, with the human uh, and I thought a, a lot about doing it in strictly binary and then converting back and forth and that, that, that just seemed like the Hardway Engineering Company um, and so we, we said well it had to have uh, three registers so that we had an X, Y and a Z register because just about everything that we would do would require um, uh, uh, three three registers to work. I mean, you look at a sine, cosine, uh, uh, exponential. Exponential, yes, you got a, a log and an exponential register, um, but it's nice to have a spare one uh, that you can keep stuff in, uh, so you can resolve it down and create the other and so on. Um, so it kind of knew what what the basic elements had to be in it. And, and we were talking about you know, battery life and so on. And there was a few of us, we had full-time jobs otherwise, but we would get together and, and chat about these things. And uh, I lived across the street from Hewlett for during some of that time. And he would call up and say, uh, or his secretary would say, uh, can Bill get a ride with you? And I, sure. Uh, and I was reluctant to say Bill who. You know, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I assumed it was that Bill. There's only one and, Bill in the company uh, with no last name, right? Yeah. <laughs> but um, well, and all of us called him Hewlett. Uh, not maybe oh, not really? his face. Yeah. So anyhow, uh, and then then yes, well, he would have me captive when I give him a ride, and um, and he'd say, Well, Dave, how are you coming with with getting that um, you know into being able to fit in my pocket, and I would, um, uh, I'd say, well, I'm working on it, and I, I saw this chipset recently from Visicom or from, from some other, a lot of Japanese companies were making four-function calculators with, uh, with chipsets, and we looked at, uh, and I was one, it was called the LSI something, and uh, uh, I think it was the LSI 8, and I think it had eight chips, something like that. And I know DEC had something uh, that was building a machine that was also called the LSI-8 on a board. But we were looking at different architectures and this is, it just didn't, it, it didn't fit. Um, and then, um, I forget, I think it was Paul Stoff, uh, the uh, director of HP Labs, uh, the audio video group, I think we were still called in. Uh, he got a call or, or told us about that Fairchild had uh, developed a, a calculator uh, architecture and that they were willing to sell the pieces of it. And so myself and a couple of other guys went down there to talk to them and we saw this architecture and I uh, and, and it looked uh, it looked promising. It, it looked like it had, um, elements that, that made it capable of doing what we needed to do in the pocket calculator. You know, it, it wasn't a, a grand and glorious computer, and it wasn't a general purpose uh, 
um, architecture uh, of uh, controller or whatever. It seemed to be just a calculator engine. And what it was was a, a racetrack. Uh, and shift registers were the most economical form of uh, use of silicon. And it was in uh, an MOS technology uh, called PMOS, uh, positive uh, dope uh, metal oxide semiconductor. And, uh, and that was the, uh, the primary integrated circuit for, for high density. Oh, we, it, trying to do it with bipolar logic was just out of the question. Used too much power and too much real estate. So the only, the only thing was metal oxide semiconductor, which uh, just had a, uh, a gate and a, and a source and a drain. A, a very elementary transistors. It was just like turning on a valve. And um, uh, it, the architecture, and I got excited about it. Uh, and I, I said, hey, I, I think this could work. And we could, you know, we could shape this into a few chips and I had estimated how much read-only memory would be needed to step-by-step to step go through the algorithms. Um, and, and I had learned how to do uh, a, a lot of economies of, uh, for example, the, the algorithm to produce sine, cosine, tangent, and so on, uh, or, or no, whole, the complement of those, the secant, and so on, uh, are all done by determining the tangent. Um, there is a, a, a secanting or stretching error to try to do the sine and the cosine by themselves. But uh, the tangent comes out exactly right to full significant, as, as many significant places as you have. So if you got 12 digit uh, of, uh, uh, of architecture, you can certainly uh, round that down to 10 digits with, with good accuracy with uh, plus or minus one count. Um, and then you calculate the sign by doing a trigonometric identity. Uh, the sign is equal to the tangent divided by the square root of one plus the tangent squared. And see, so once you, uh, you go through that, then, then you don't need a separate uh, algorithm for each of the others. They, they just simply will do it by uh, a little bit of uh, arithmetic, no sleight of hand, just arithmetic. But the speed of it needed to be such that we then could, after calculating the tangent, do these other operations, which were considered elementary. I mean, squaring, and we did have a, a square root algorithm, uh, and that was one of the first things I developed because it was necessary in the others. And, and that was just a pseudo division, very, very simple. And it took about the same time as a division. So. Uh, anyhow, I had kind of mapped out the, the programs. Before we even had an architecture, I knew what we needed. I mean, we certainly needed the, uh, uh, the instruction set needed a, an add, a complement. Um, uh, there is no subtract because you just do a complement and add. And, and the way that, uh, uh, I mean, if I needed a subtract, I could have put in a subtract, but it was much easier to work at a, a basic level with as few instructions as possible. And, uh, and so these, the architecture then was, was pretty much in my mind what I needed and what were the, uh, uh, the number of program steps needed to, to implement the functions. So when we saw this, this architecture at Fairchild looked pretty good and so on, it, it looked like it, and we asked them if they could make some changes. And uh, they uh, just just to tune it for our needs. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I guess they came back and they said, "Well, they really weren't interested in, in making any changes. They wanted to sell this as a general purpose uh, calculator to everybody." And I hadn't told them what what I wanted to do with it. They they were selling it as a fixed point machine, uh, and it would be the heart of the four function machines, that, that's really what they wanted to push. So I uh, had asked uh, the designer or one of the people working at Fairchild, I said, you know, your architecture looks, looks really good. Um, do you have a patent on it? Uh, where did it come from? He says, oh, no, we saw this 
uh, somewhere else and, and it uh, a general purpose uh, um, showing and, and uh, it was uh, I think it was originally used as, in a uh, cash register and he said no be my guest you can you can <laughs> use it if you want uh, that wouldn't be Silicon Valley today <laughs> <laughs> but you know it, it actually when you're talking engineer to engineer I think it still is but but if you but let the lawyers use it yeah, if you want yeah well, no you get the lawyers involved and they oh that you know then you need a you know, confidential agreement and so on and so forth but now that I, I think that people are still more or less the same today on, a, on an engineer to engineer basis all right so uh, Fairchild's PMOS and, and I understand Fairchild not wanting to change anything because at the time they really were the leading semiconductor manufacturer in the valley uh, they, they were the inventor of the planar integrated circuit they, they really had the world by the tail they didn't really need to do custom stuff I think I understand that so PMOS was bringing you the density you wanted and it was bringing you the power reduction that you needed versus bipolar to make a battery powered device but you couldn't get it made by the leading manufacturer of that stuff so what did you do well that's, I spent probably a, a couple of weeks uh, thinking about the architecture and I redid it since since they weren't going to do exactly what I wanted anyhow well, I redid it redid the architecture to fit exactly what I thought that the algorithms needed now keep in mind that I had never uh, done the architecture never simulated it uh, but I had transferred it more or less from the 9100 and and into uh, a, um, a, an instruction set architecture. I knew what the instruction had, uh, instruction set had to, to to look like. I knew how many bits long that the instruction word had to be. And so what I did was take that architecture, modify it, and then uh, went to my boss, who was Tom Whitney then, and said, "Here's an architecture that uh, Fairchild doesn't." And he was with me, I think, at the time we talked to Fairchild. Fairchild doesn't want to do this. Um, uh, if I just tweak it here and there and uh, have these changes, I can make it fit what we need for a, for Hewlett's pocket calculator. And in the meantime, I think he uh, had been having some discussions with a couple of semiconductor, other semiconductor companies. One of them, AMI, uh, that was here in Santa Clara, and the other was um, uh, Mostech which was down uh, in uh, just north of Dallas, uh, it's been out of TI. And they were doing some high density circuits uh, for other uses. And so we, we set upon this, uh, this path of, okay, we will design the circuit. We will go to each of these companies and we didn't want them to, to find out what we were doing. So we didn't take the whole chipset to both of the companies. We took a couple of the chips to one company, a couple of the chips to the other company. And we all we gave them was a spec, and what we needed, we did not tell them what it was for. Uh, we just said it was a, it was a, uh, a test engine uh, for the uh, electrical measurement <laughs> testing. And because uh, we're HP and we had never been in a calculator and, you know, hadn't been in, in that part of the business, and we, and they kept saying, well, well, now what are you doing? And we say, well, this is a, a special, you know, we make gas chromatographs, we do this, we do that. This is a special add-on to to our, our test hardware that we're trying to get. Okay. Well, we talked a lot about uh, the logic chips. And so you've left those with, with AMI and Moztec to do a couple of chips each. Uh, let's talk about the displays. Right? Because most of the calculators at that time are using Nixie tubes with high voltage power supplies. And they're not taking advantage of LED displays because LEDs have only been invented in 62. So they're still relatively new. Uh, uh, you have to remember that, that HP had its own LED factory and had been producing LEDs for, for some time and in fact had set up uh, HP labs. Uh, there was a, um, uh, I think it was HP Associates, I'm sorry, HP Associates, which was uh, allied with HP Labs. And uh, there was a couple of people there. I think Jack Melkor had headed that up. John Atella 
but there was a, a number of HP people on the board of HP Associates, and so it was a um, both a, a separate company, still it was affiliated, and it was uh, doing uh, a lot of LED work. And so uh, at the same time that we were, uh, you know, sorting out for integrated circuits that would go inside the pocket calculator, there was uh, a number of people that were trying to do a display that could be used if we ever got the rest of the calculator going. And, and a couple of things there. Uh, one, if, if you just look at the LEDs, uh, and it's a seven segment LED, and you say it was seven segment with a period, uh, then you say, well, uh, that, that's just very simple. Well, it turns out if, if you put a lens over it, and this is just uh, it, it's not intuitive. It, it, you put a lens over it, huh, you make it look bigger. Oh, but you can also shrink the LED segments. If you shrink them, the power goes down. Um, then uh, one of the things that, that I started fooling around with, and it was, and I forget whether it was during the development of the algorithms, I just would take a, a moment, it the last two months, to jump into something else, and it was the, the shape of the segments. One of the things we found that at that time that the, that the segments, they didn't appear to have uniform brightness. And we, we discovered, uh, you know, the, the, the scientists, the, the PhDs, they all knew, well, it's the perimeter to area ratio. And we have leakage current. So if you keep the perimeter to area ratio the same, you'll have equal leakage, leakage current percentage, and therefore they'll all look the same right now. Oh, okay, all right, we'll, we'll try to do that. And so we can shape the, the LED segments. Oh, then let's not make it look like a backwards E, let's make it look like a, a three and put a little serifs on it so that there's no, uh, you know, mistaking and, and because when you look at the number, you, you want to know exactly what it is. And then, then somebody else said, well, we've been doing some studies and we found that if we strobe them, that we get a higher light output for the same current or conversely for the same light output, you could reduce the current. And because it, uh, it's, it's duty cycle, they call it the superlinearity that the, uh, as you increase the, the current, then the light goes up greater than, and I think it's related to this leakage again, uh, but we didn't delve into the details too much if we had the PhDs for that. We just just started implementing and we and I kept turning the duty cycle down and I got down to a 1% duty cycle and I said, my God, I'm hitting this with milliamps and I, I'm getting more than adequate light out. Now, what's this going to do to the lifetime? So then we set up an experiment and that was running during the time, the whole development time, that we, we would strobe one set at a 1% duty cycle. So it's actually getting 100 times more current than another set. And, and we had photographic film that compared before and after and had these two. And, and the actual, our measurement systems at the time just were not picking up, weren't sensitive to, to determine the exactness of the lumens coming off. So we used photographic film to see if it looked the same. And you know, six months time, yeah, we had no degradation. So it was all of these little things. That's why I say that there was so many things that, that contributed to the pocket calculator. We had a, a PhD working on the DC to DC converter. And remember, we had to have a, a plus 12 volts and a plus 6 volts, and and uh, then a, a minus uh, 5 volts. Uh, That's for the back bias. Yeah, and we, we just had. And, and it all had to be supplied from from, from some special uh, NICAD batteries, rechargeable batteries, that had to fit in this case. And, and so they were custom. So we just had, and that power supply, I think, was 90 plus percent efficient, which was really unheard of in a DC to DC converter. So Is there anything special that they did to, to achieve that? It, it's just, it's how you wound the coils and, and the coupling of the coil and the transistor duty cycle, it, it, it was amazing. Yes, I, I, and I forget all the exact details, but like I said, he it was, it was a PhD scientist <laughs> in electrical engineering that worked on that, got that, that efficiency. So we've been going through, we've been discussing all these technical aspects, and so we've talked about 
overcoming power and density limitations with, by the introduction of PMOS. So the PMOS finally got you to the integrated circuit technology you needed. Uh, discovering uh, low duty cycle strobing for LED displays so that you can get the display that you needed. Uh, high efficient power supply so you can use three NICAD batteries to power the whole thing. So those are the technical details. What about the marketing details? I understand that, that Hewlett was concerned about how many of these would sell and he actually commissioned SRI to do a market research study. Uh, it was, that was very interesting and that was at a time when Hewlett was by himself. Packard had gone off to war. He was the Deputy uh, Secretary of Defense. Uh, was, uh, Melvin Laird had asked him to, under the Nixon administration, to come to, to uh, Washington and, and be his deputy. And, uh, and so Hewlett, although he was just enthusiastic as hell about getting uh, this pocket calculator going and, and so on, when we actually said, okay, we can do it. And I, I remember, you know, saying, okay, the, the development cost is going to be about a million dollars. And he says, well, 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 you know, I think we ought, you know, and he had a way about him. He, he'd say, well, hold off, guys, wait a minute. I think we ought to uh, check with, let me, let me call my friends at Stanford Research Institute, SRI, and, and have them do a, a focus group or market study or something and tell us, give us some feedback. Well, in the meantime, we just used our under the table budget and just worked on this thing like mad. And I remember them, SRI coming back, a fellow, his last name was Calhoun. And he says, you know, we've done a lot of focus groups and we've done a lot of research the best we can. And there's just, there's nothing like this is scientific calculator. Uh, there's no scientific pocket calculator. There, if it's a four-function machine, add, subtract, multiply, and divide, it's going to cost, should cost under $100. But we don't have uh, any idea of what a scientific calculator was going to do, uh, was going to cost. And we had estimated the cost at somewhere around $400, uh, because those of us in, in the laboratory used to take a uh, the material list of, of a new product and we'd multiply it by pi and that would generally give us a uh, what the market price and let the, the bean counters go out and, and do all the calculations and and they'd come back with a number pretty close to that. Now if it was a, a, a you know, it, engineers always like you know, capsule solutions. So if it was a tight marketplace, well then we multiplied it by E, 2.7. So, so it, and, you know, that seemed to work. <laughs> okay, so so that's how you got the number. No, well, now, you, the first 35 rolled off the line, price at 395 And my understanding is that HP shipped $100 with every unit, essentially, the, for the first few units. I, yeah, and I'm not sure. That was um, the, the startup. We had no division for, to build these. And, in fact, uh, there was, uh, and before we got the first one going, actually, um, I had given up on trying to, to simulate the, the, um, the algorithms using B5500 at Stanford or, or the Remington RAN. I think we had a, no, we had a solid state 90, had a Univac 90 uh, at HP at the time in our, uh, in our computer room. So uh, a bunch of guys had built up a, uh, HP was also developing uh, uh, computers uh, at that time, and just starting to uh, 2116, I think, was the first one. And so they had developed a, a simulator or an emulator that I could use for that. So I, I had tested it out, tried it out, and everything. And then we got the first prototypes going. I think they were in December. And of which year? Mm, this had to be 71, I believe. Right. Okay. And. Uh, uh, anyhow, we gave them to key people. We had nine or ten or so, and so these were full functioning units. These were not a these, prototype these, that, of an they, umbilical. And in fact, yes, it, and I used to use an umbilical in the lab. But when we gave the one to Terman, he, he uh, Fred Terman, and he was uh, I think the dean, dean of the School of Engineering at that time. He later became provost at Stanford. But anyhow, he he had got this thing in his hand. <laughs> and he kept looking for the wire because he could not believe that, that we could do this. Now, now he was, you know, Hewlett was his protege and so on, but he looked at this, 
But darned if he didn't do the first calculation he did was he entered 90 degrees and then hit hit sign or no he hit tangent and it blinked at him because it, the algorithm blew up uh, <laughs> uh, because it, it's the division by zero right. um, and uh, and that's the, you know it, it it's supposed to be infinity and and I didn't have a, a trap for that. And so you know, I was embarrassed, and, but he understood, and you know, it, 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 he was really impressed that it, uh, it that it did that calculation. Um, I think it was uh, Charlie Towns or Louis Alvarez. One of them, and I think both of them have won Nobel prizes. Uh, was given, I think it was Louis Alvarez at, at UC Berkeley, and was given one of them. And he looked at it and played it for you know. A few minutes, and he said, "It's the eighth wonder of the world," and and it was really impressive. We gave it to other Stanford professors that just could not believe it was just a select group, and uh, it was. Uh, and and I tell you, it used to be if you knew how to play the piano, you were very popular at parties. I went to parties soon after the introduction at HP 35, and all the guys would be gathered around somebody. <laughs> they were huddling over somebody playing the calculator. He was actually entering numbers and they were, what is it? Do? Oh, enter this number and so on. And, and it was taken, you know, it, it was such a, a, a change uh, and it was, uh, you know, it, uh, it was a cultural change, let me say. It. Well, speaking of culture, how did the HP 35 get its name? Well, uh, Tom Osborne, I think, uh, was trying to run uh, Name the Baby Contest, and uh, so he was soliciting inputs, uh, the math marvel, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, Athena, goddess of wisdom, uh, and, and a, a bunch of these, and Hewlett walked up and said, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're trying to figure out what to call the thing. He says, well, oh, we'll call it HP 35. He says, well, why? Oh, it's got 35 keys, I mean, <laughs> Hewlett was like that. And, and it was funny, talking about Hewlett, we were having lunch one day and I, I uh, and Hewlett Packard, when they were there, they used to eat in the cafeteria, and, I, and so Hewlett came and sat down and I said, hey, Bill, they, um, GE has asked for a quote on, on 20,000 uh, of these calculators. He says, oh. There must be something wrong. Why, why in the world would they want 20,000? And I said, well, maybe they want to give it to every one of their engineers. He says, no, oh, no, they can, they can borrow each other just like we do. Yeah. <laughs> he, you know, even though, and, and this was funny about Bill, even though it was his project, his concept, that right from the get-go, he still, you know, $400 was a big piece of money. And he wanted people to share these. And small enough that you could, yes, you could load it to your guy at the next bench and he could use it for his calculation and then give it back to you and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about the, the moment when you first handed Bill the first HP 35 that was working. What was his reaction? I don't, you know, I don't really remember. Um, I think it was more like, you know, giving it to him, <laughs> you know, and he would say something like, well, about time. I've been waiting for this for a long time. <laughs> now, I've been asking you guys for two years for this. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, so, you know, SRI had given uh, a report that basically said, we have no idea how well this is going to do. Exactly. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that HP was completely unprepared for the success of the HP 35. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? We, uh, um, like I had said, we had, had kept it pretty much secret at uh, uh, with AMI and Mostec, the, the two vendors that were doing uh, half of the chips. Uh, I think Mostec had a uh, read-only memory design that, that really um, helped on the size and so on, so we let them do the read-only memory, and I think that uh, uh, they may have also done the control and timing, and then the arithmetic and register chip was done by uh, AMI. Um, and uh, we had done the bipolar driver for the uh, LED display uh, in in house. Uh, HP did have a uh, bipolar uh, development lab, and, and so we'd done that. Uh, 
uh, in-house. But anyhow, uh, the initial contracts, uh, the, the tooling and such for uh, the molds for the cases, the, um, the, the key molds, uh, we... Uh, uh, These are triple shot molds? Well, and I'm not sure that the first ones were. We, we were trying, being very economical, uh, we weren't sure how many we were going to sell. We had limited the production order to a minimum production order with, with both of the semiconductor companies to uh, 100,000 units. Um, and, well, when this thing took off, I mean, it, for one thing, HP was, was totally unprepared to even market this because how do you sell it? Um, they were, there, several of them were given to every field engineers and those went immediately. I mean, and, and in fact, uh, there was such a demand that people would say, I, I know I placed my order last week, but if I give you an extra $100, do you think I can get it faster? <laughs> and and you know, three ninety five. There was the the, the price was, was no price resistance. It, 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 there was no price difference. The, there was no uh, concern over that. Um, and uh, uh, and I remember the, um, the one of the marketing managers uh, that later on, this originally the first units were were manufactured in Cupertino as part of the, um, that was computer division or computer uh, group at that time. And we were, we were putting them together out in the warehouse. And uh, then finally, uh, the calculator was made in uh, APD, Advanced Product Division, which was across the street from the Cuper, Cupertino group. So, uh, the, but the marketing manager for the, for the calculator group, Chuck Comiso, was having to learn, uh, read, well he had to subscribe to Women Wear Daily, which told him uh, what the, how you market in department stores, because it, it turned out that going out through the HP sales, I mean, uh, for one thing, the markup on the thing wasn't enough where we could afford the commission, because they would normally get something like 15% in electronic instruments. And certainly that wasn't the way to, to sell this. And, you know, we learned things like, well, what, what do you expect in sales per square foot on the first floor of Macy's as different from the second floor and depending upon what aisle it's in? And, and so this was a totally new yeah, concept. This is not HP. And this, this was you know, such a departure from HP that um, it, it was rather, uh, you know, it, 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 changed, it changed a lot of the culture at HP because now all of a sudden HP was in a totally different line of business and I really felt sorry for some companies like Deepskin, which uh, used to make sliders, and they went out of business in a year. Uh, K and E still made papers, but uh. okay. Well, this being the 30th anniversary, maybe you want to take some time to to look back over the last 35 years and and give us a summary of how you feel the, the introduction of the 35 has influenced. Um, in both society in general, I think, and, and also how it uh, affected HP. We already started a little bit on how it affected HP and really got HP to dip its toe into the consumer market. Uh, but you know, anything else occurred to you as far as uh, the past 35 years? Well, during, uh, um, during the development or, or soon afterward, I was got very involved at HP in college recruiting. and. Uh, and of course, every time I'd go out to a, a college or university, I was responsible for the Southwest schools, uh, New Mexico, and um, West Texas. And um, so we'd uh, go down there about every quarter, and I'd always give a talk on, on the HP, you know, the, how the HP 35 was developed and, and how the algorithms worked and, and what some of the logic was and so on. Uh, and, but the professors would say, well, you know, I, I love you and I hate you because yeah. uh, with, within such a short time, it, it changed how they uh, do examinations because do you allow a person with a calculator? Used to be you had to do everything, you know, you couldn't even have a slide roll. Now, some people had calculators, other people didn't. Do you make them available for the entire class? So it, uh, it and, uh, 
quite a sense, I, I think it revolutionized uh, mathematical education, uh, at least in the, in the, the grade schools. Uh, and people certainly are using them now in, in, uh, in colleges and universities. And the things that you can do on a calculator today are things that you would have computer run run, run for you know overnight. And, uh, and you can do all kinds of, of, of what ifs. Uh, you don't even have to, to try to solve the problem directly. You can try various perturbations of the problem and vary uh, some of the variables and and see what they come out. And so people can do this extremely rapidly. And so uh, on the, the flip side, though, have we actually forgotten how to do multiplication tables? Can we not uh, uh, calculate things as fast without having a, a, a pocket calculator or, or nowadays a, a computer? I think it's uh, certainly uh, uh, Nobody balances their checkbook, I don't believe, uh, by hand anymore. No, I think you're probably right. Well, um, I want to thank you very much. This has been a terrific interview. Well, I've enjoyed and, and certainly enjoyed talking about uh, the, the old days. Okay. And I want to thank all of you for being with us. Uh, my name is Steve Leapson, a contributing editor with EDN Magazine. And we've been talking with Dave Cochran, key developer for the HP 35 which is enjoying its 35th anniversary. Thanks very much, Dave. Okay.